Hello, I'm the Earth's Luke Cartographer, and this is the story of the Dire Chemical Massacre. Before we go into the tragedy that is the massacre itself, we need to go into a little background. Because this topic is intrinsically tied to ghouls, we need to cover what ghouls are in the Fallout universe. In the real world, humans exposed to high doses of radiation suffer radiation poisoning. Depending on the dosage, severity of radiation exposure ranges from mild to very severe. Depending on the type of exposure and degree of exposure, these symptoms can vary from nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, to those symptoms combined with hair and skin loss, and a few other nasty things. In some cases, patients undergo what has been referred to as walking ghost phase. These patients have experienced enough radiation that it has destroyed their bone marrow and intestinal lining. These issues don't affect the victim immediately, but shortly their inability to produce white blood cells combined with the sloughing off of the intestinal lining and the exposure of this now unprotected digestive tract to raw sewage kills the patient. Should sufferers of radiation sickness receive a dosage low enough and treatment quickly enough, they may survive, but carry an increased risk of cancer and the potential for an increased occurrence of birth defects in their offspring should they remain fertile in the first place. Within the Volat universe, when the bombs came down, many people experienced their end in radiation poisoning, but this was not the sole effect experienced by those many billions exposed that Saturday morning. There exists a subset within the population that, when exposed to high doses of radiation, are changed. Just as with those who died, their hair fell out and their skin slept off, but unlike their neighbors, their bodies adapted rather than failed. Their bodies in fact now function better when exposed to radiation. Though their appearance is now monstrous and their voices are gravelly, features that gave them the epithet ghoul, these people in some cases no longer needed to eat even, seemingly finding sustenance in radiation alone. These ghouls also seemingly became immortal as their altered DNA stabilized their age at what they had been before their transformation. There were, and are, two different versions of people afflicted with the ghoul condition, sentient and feral. Sentient ghouls are effectively the same person mentally after the change that they were before. Obviously the psychological effects of the conversion, living through the war, and surviving for centuries, along with the everyday stresses of post-apocalyptic life means that personality-wise most of these people are very different, but they retain their mental acuity. Over time these ghouls can undergo another change and begin to slip out of who they were and become something more animalistic. When this change takes hold, they become the aforementioned feral type of ghoul. How long it takes for this change to occur varies widely, and it could well be that some that become ghouls are immediately feral. We really just don't have enough data. But we do know that some pre-war people have survived over 200 years of sentient ghouls without changing, and that by 25 years after the war, many ghouls have already become feral. I should mention here that not all ghouls were made on the day of the bombs, not all ghouls were alive before the war, and not all ghouls were made by environmental radiation. In order, many ghouls did not turn the day of the bombs. The process of ghoulification can take time, and while some started to turn the day of the bombs, others changed days, weeks, even months later, and many did not even start the process until years later. Second from that list, many ghouls were born after the war and were changed when they encountered pockets of radiation or radioactive areas unrelated to the bombs like leaking reactors. And lastly, not all ghouls were made by environmental radiation. For example, Eddie Winter, a crime boss that purposely turned himself into a ghoul before the war, and Hancock, the mayor of Good Neighbor, who ingested a radioactive chemical that changed him into a ghoul. Because of their grotesque appearance and the existence of their feral brethren, sentient ghouls experience a great deal of discrimination, especially in the early years after the war. There's more depth to ghouls, but that should suffice for the background of the general concept of ghouls, so let's get into some more specific background of the Dire Chemical Massacre itself. In the years before the war, Harpers Ferry, West Virginia was a battleground, sometimes figuratively, sometimes literally, between pro-government and separatist citizens of the city. These separatists called themselves members of the Free States Movement and believed that the government was one, irrecoverably corrupt, two, an enemy of the American people, and three, was going to embroil the United States in an apocalyptic nuclear war. Though they were correct on all three counts, before the bombs came down, they faced a lot of resistance to their ideals from the patriotic citizens of the city, who disliked these separatists so much that they even refused them medical care in the local clinic. Around September 2077, many of the Free States members declared their secession from the United States and retreated into their bunkers outside of Harpers Ferry. The next month, the bombs came down. Though we don't have an exact date of when they exited their bunkers, thanks to a report from Majority Whip Tanner Holbrook Scouts, we do know that by June 2079, the Free Staters were out of their bunkers and back in Harbors Ferry. Raleigh Clay, the leader of the Free States, if there can be such a thing in an anarchistic organization, was approached by the Harpers Ferry Mayor Miranda Vox. She asked him for assistance in rebuilding her town. Raleigh discussed the mission of rebuilding Harpers Ferry with other high-profile members and put out a call for assistance in the task to all Free States members. Over the years, the Free States and their former political enemies in Harpers Ferry would work hard to make the city habitable. Barricading streets, building walls, installing rad storm dampeners, operating a clinic, and organizing hunting and salvaging parties to build up a stock of supplies. Though the city would eventually fall in an attack by the Scorched, we're interested in a story that evolved in Harpers Ferry over the course of the intervening years. As time wore on after the bombs, the people of Harpers Ferry began to encounter a new type of enemy they would know as the Ghoul. 
In these early days, they took one look at the grotesque appearance of these people and formulated an unstated policy of shoot on sight. The aforementioned clinic set up by the Free States within Harbors Ferry was operated by VTU grad Ella Ames. She was helped by the local esthetician Lucy Harwick, and though Lucy wasn't tremendously skilled with medicine, she helped ease Ella's workload. Sometime before the winter of 2082, Daniel Whitby, described as a local boy by Ella, came down with an illness. Most people in town thought he was recovering from the flu under Lucy's care. When it came to light that Daniel had in fact become a sentient ghoul, and that Lucy had hidden his condition while hunting for a cure, she was forced to flee town and Daniel was placed in quarantine. Ella had heard of the possibility of sentient ghouls, but she had never gotten the chance to study one thanks to the shoot on site policy of Harper's Ferry guards. She finally had in Daniel the conclusive proof that along with the tremulous, spastic, ravening, feral ghouls, there existed a variety that were different from other people only in their appearance. The public opinion of Harper's Ferry, though, was decidedly against Daniel Whitby. In these early years after the war, just as the nature of ghouls was a general unknown, there was also a lack of understanding of how people came to be afflicted with the condition. Some, like a woman named Sharon, believed that ghoulification could be a contagious illness. Others, including a man named Leonard, believed that ghoulification was the result of what the war had done to the world. But regardless of what their view was on what made Daniel Whitby a ghoul, they were united in the belief that Daniel needed to be exiled, either alone or with the recently encountered responders in their headquarters in Charleston. Though we don't know of the outcome of Daniel Whitby, we do know a lot more about the woman who tried to help him, Lucy Harwick. Sometime after Lucy was forced to flee Harvest Ferry, she too became a ghoul, an outcome that cannot have helped but confirm the erroneous assumption that the condition is contagious. Lucy did not appreciate the term ghoul, believing that it was derogatory, and that's really a point that's hard to contradict. She instead referred to ghouls as the changed, and years before William Keller would shepherd the remaining sentient ghouls of Appalachia to underworld and the capital wasteland, Lucy attempted to shepherd the ghouls into a new accepting society within the Valley Galleria Mall. Though she was somewhat successful in this attempt, the society she created would not last because of a hunter back in Harvest Ferry by the name of Duncan McCann. Duncan McCann had been left with a burning hatred for ghouls thanks to the deaths of his wife and two children at the hands of a pack of ferals. Led by both his desire to protect Harpers Ferry and an all-consuming hunger for vengeance, Duncan took out a large hunting party to find them that included many of Harpers Ferry's best guards. Kendall Sims, Randy Calloway, Terrence Quince, Annie Dolly Garcia, Jacqueline Murphy, Courtney Kelly, Jackson Lake, and the Free State's Mr. Gutsy Hardball departed Harpers Ferry, heading south to destroy the swarm of ghouls that had been spotted at the nearby Valley Galleria. At this time, many in Harpers Ferry still didn't make the distinction between feral and sentient. After they rousted the ghouls from the Valley Galleria, the hunting party chased Lucy Harwick and her changed across the Shenandoah and north along its eastern bank. Not far from the river, at least two of the hunting party were wounded by ghoul attacks. Incapable of carrying on with the rest of the hunting party, Courtney Kelly and Jacqueline Murphy were forced to hunker down with Hardball and await assistance from Harpers Ferry. Assistance that would never come. The hunting party continued to track the change north until they clashed again near Haven Church, a site where Lucy had recruited sentient ghouls to her cause. In this firefight, both the hunting party and the change took casualties. Nari Samir, a non-ghoul member of Lucy Harvest Group, and the sister to the ghoul Sarah Samir, fell in the battle, dropping a prototype hazmat suit and the key to the dire chemical sewers, the sought-after refuge of the changed. Randy Calloway with the hunting party succumbed to a bad leg wound to the site, but not before recording a message for Ella Ames, in which he noted that the ghouls they were hunting were sentient, but that Duncan didn't care. Having cornered the quarry within the sewers of Dire Chemical, the remaining members of the hunting party moved in for the kill. It was in the closing minutes of this fight that Kendall Sims realized that not only were the ghouls they were hunting sentient, but that they were led by her old friend Lucy Harwick. When Kendall refused to fire on Lucy and Sarah, Duncan, mad with grief and filled with righteous hatred of ghouls, fired on Kendall, killing her. Duncan then slew the remaining ghouls in his family's name before slumping down and dying of his wounds sustained in the massacre. Though we don't find all of their bodies strewn across the countryside, the remaining members of the hunting party did not make it back to Harvest Ferry by the time of the Scorch attack and were listed as missing. Not only were Duncan McCann's actions hideous acts of murder, the loss of the personnel killed in his mad dash across the mire deprived Harvest Ferry of some of its best guards and hunters. Though the entirety of Appalachia eventually succumbed to the Scorch, there is no way of knowing how many more in Harpers Ferry may have survived had these lost men and women been manning the barricades on the day of the Scorch attack. Personally, I have never experienced a loss as horrific as Duncan McCann's, but the loss of his family to feral ghouls is no excuse to slaughter sentient ghouls, especially those who wanted nothing more than to be left alone. While you could initially potentially give him something of a pass due to the lack of understanding of the ghoul condition, as soon as those ghouls started talking and pleading with him to stop, that understanding of his actions disappears. But that should do it for the Dire Chemical Massacre. I will note here that this lore has covered content found within the Tracking Unknown's quest, and that Dire Chemical, the place that the change attempted to find refuge, has an interesting history as well that I will cover in a different video. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you have any comments or questions, leave them for me and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.